I love adventure. I love feeling that I can help people. Story Doctor was not a name I gave myself, um, but it kind of works because of the story medicine. I only have one memory of a story in my childhood. I wasn't a child that was brought up with rich storytelling, although I'm sure my mother would have read stories to me. But there was one time in my life when I was in bed with an illness for quite a few months, and my mother bought me a book. It was called Araminta, Arabella and Aristide. And it was about handkerchiefs that lived in a drawer and the girl that owned them tied the handkerchiefs into different knots to make girls and boys and frogs and different characters and then made stories on her bed. Thinking of people who inspired me, my grandmother and grandfather who lived in the country town where I grew up were such models of health and vitality. They lived to 96 and 101. They grew their own vegetables. They had really good morals and values. My grandfather had the most sparkling eyes. My mother inspired me. My father inspired me because he really, there was a saying he had, where there's a will, there's a way. And I think um, I think that really spoke to me, has still does through my life when it comes to obstacles. And then I have met various human beings, teachers, um, philosophers, singers, Leonard Cohen and others, Nelson Mandela and um, Archbishop Tutu. I actually met him, what an honour. I was born in a country town in Australia, but I did grow up with a wonderful time in nature the first 10 years of my life. Once my brothers and I had done all the jobs for our very strict father, we could then head off into exploring the gullies and the bush around our, uh, where we lived. The first defining moment for me to really become who really follow my path was I had enrolled at university, I had a scholarship, but I didn't really know what I was doing and what I wanted to do and at that point I met my first husband. He was a surfer travelling from South Africa. It was very difficult for my parents, I dropped out of university and left Australia and hitchhiked around the world for two and a half years. So that was really my first time of doing what I felt I needed to do. And then possibly the next very defining moments was having three sons quite quickly close to each other. They're now 41, 40 and 38. But I loved being a mother. It was difficult at times. I was a single parent for many years, but I loved being a mother. I've always um, experienced love for different people, but when you become a mother, it is beyond description, the love you feel for this tiny little baby that you are totally the one responsible for. And it was such a gift, but it was also such a challenge because my three boys were born very close together and so the, the stress of hardly having time to breathe some days. I remember to keep my cup of tea hot, I would have a pot of water on the stove to put my teacup back in, just so I could have a hot cup of tea to drink. There was hardly time 
for myself for six, seven years. But somehow the love got me through. We had rosters in our house and they were all involved in doing jobs, cooking meals, mowing the lawn, cleaning the bathroom. So in many ways that was very good growth for them and it's too late now, I can't change whether or not I push too much responsibility too quickly. I remember, probably not very often, maybe about once a year, I would just start crying and go in and lie on my bed and cry. And then I actually found out that made a huge difference in their behavior. But I realized that was not something I could do every day. But I don't think I could ever been in a position to give parenting talks without having had the experience of a very challenging child. That can make it easier because we are thirsting for the balance and that thirsting for it will help us find a way. And actually that forced me to be more creative, which then led into me running creative parenting courses. So it all linked up. And then ever since my books have been translated into different languages, I'm having so many new rich experiences. Also, I have five grandchildren. They're, that is also such a rich pleasure. When I look at children today, I think one of the main needs that is sometimes out of balance is lack of time in nature, lack of time outside, lack of opportunity to take risks, lack of time to be bored and, and then find, their, find your own way out of that boredom. Less material things but more of the joyous, interactive human things like stories, songs, games. Chance to do nothing, lie on the grass and look at the clouds. There is a very big difference, especially with younger children, of talking in story language or talking in a dry, literal approach. Sometimes that direct approach is needed, but many times it's much more effective if you want the children's shoes to be put together instead of in an intellectual way explaining the shoes need to be side by side, out of the way, where you can find them next time, just your shoes are friends and friends like to be together. 95% of children would really hear that and want to put their shoes together. As far as I understand why picture language, story language can be so much more effective is that story language is speaking to the imagination. It's an interesting phenomenon because scientists or the scientific viewpoint would really struggle trying to grasp what it is. But in life experiences, I've recently read a book written by a prisoner of a concentration camp and he said it was the imagination that helped him survive. The imagination helped him write poetry and one of his, of what he said was poetry tied earth to heaven. And that's what helped him survive. And I think that makes sense even if you don't believe in heaven or God, but 
to a higher strength that you wouldn't, if you were just relying on the everyday physical strength, you would not have survived. And imagination has this, I, I believe, this higher quality. Children are born with a very rich, deep, broad, wide imagination. And the mother thought about this with picture language. And next time she saw her nine-year-old boy get angry, she said, try to be a lightning rod and catch that, that anger. In many ways, it's the most valuable tool for learning that we can work with with children. And yet it has been, it sort of lost its importance because the emphasis on, on teaching the intellect seems to have dominated the scene. And yet the imagination is equally important and a powerful way of learning and knowing. Usually at tidy up time, we don't say the toys need to go back on the shelf, they need to go home. Even that, it's a subtle difference. And this is why picture language speaks to children. Is story language a creative tool for every parent? For every parent, for every teacher, for every grandparent, for nurses, for doctors, for psychologists, for school counsellors, for librarians, yes. But of course it's not the only strategy that we would work with. But to not use it seems to be quite a sad thing because it's such a natural, it's so natural in our humanness to to work in story. People have done it for thousands of years. But I think it's a wonderful gift and, and it's an um, integral part of our humanness. One of his quotes, logic will get you from A to B, imagination can take you anywhere. Can a story heal the soul as a pill can heal the body? I prefer to never say that a story can heal, even though sometimes it might do amazing healing. I think the best thing that we should be thinking about with stories is perhaps they can help a little bit. We should have this helping intention because in some situations a story would never heal. And I suppose just, for example, if, if someone has just experienced a lot of death and brutality, nothing, no pills, no stories, is going to help heal what they have been through. But if a story can help a small way, help to find some strength, some tiny hope for the future, help to soothe, help to motivate, then in many ways it can be more effective than a pill. And if you're talking about a chemical pill, there is hopefully with a story no side effects. There is an advantage. But one day, as the mother and daughter were driving back to the farm from the school, they had a head-on collision and both mother and daughter were killed very instantly. It took many weeks, many months, and as they worked, they chanted, Brave beavers we be as we work on this tree. As night follows day, we beaver away, knowing life gives way to a brand new day. And after many months of work, the beavers had carved and shaped new homes for the animals, new homes for the birds, and new homes for the insects.
strive to keep this human balance in your homes, in your parenting. And when I talk human balance, I'm talking a connection to story, a connection to nature, a connection to song, a connection to being together, to having time without digital extras, um, to not think that material possessions are what bring happiness, even though of course sometimes there can be small amounts of joy there. Use stories with your children, read them stories, share stories, act out stories, make up stories together, play games with story making, go on walks and tell stories to each other. Bring stories in, in as many ways as you can. I have lived in East Africa, they wear kikoi's and on the kikoi is always some amazing picture language full of wisdom. The writing might say something like, a bird only flies with its own wings. 